Barry, I suppose for, from my perspective, just as a top line view, um, the laws of physics and the laws of nature are ironically as confusing as they are useful. So obviously they have a, a lot of predictive power, a lot of explanatory power. Uh, obviously we can see that all the way from the laws of physics in how it's applied to engineering and how planes fly, so to speak. Historically, some historians and philosophers um, state, and it's quite a popular view, that we get the laws of physics and the laws of nature from the hangover and what, we, what was previous theological laws of um, nature coming from God. We've replaced those with the laws of physics. Now, even that in itself can be a bit confusing. We've got um, Newton's laws of motion, but Einstein's theory, by definition, of relativity isn't a law. So from your perspective, um, give us a, back, a background review of the general historical considerations of the laws of physics, how they've evolved over time, and your general understanding of them. Yeah, so that's really good. So the question about the history of the concept of laws of physics is something that really needs investigation and exploration. And one of the things that I found when I started looking into this is that no one has written a history, no historian has written a history of the concept of laws of physics. That's sort of astonishing. Mm. There's some good histories of the concept of probability and some good discussions by particularly British uh, historians of science of the very early concept of the of, of laws. Uh, but no one has written a comprehensive history of the concept of the laws of physics from the earliest times when the, something like this idea really arose in various cultures in, in Greece. And there's similar ideas that you might find in India and China. Um, but it really only took form in the 16th and 17th century in Europe. Um, and the idea then was this, that scientific or sort of what was passed for scientific explanation which was in sort of an Aristotelian form. There were a certain kinds of, Aristotle had the idea that there were various kinds of things. These various kinds of things had various um, uh, teleologies, what they were, their functions, what they were supposed to do, various essences, and so on. And his, his main model for, for science actually was biology, the way he thought about biology. So there's like various kinds of species, each with having their own form and what they were supposed to do. And he, he extended this idea to, to physics as, as well. So the basic idea for explaining was explaining what happens in terms of what the, the function or the end of some activity is, and in terms of the causal powers that something has. Um, in the 16th, 17th century, um, this idea began to be shaken. One of the reasons was that mathematics started being developed, and Aristotelian explanations were not very uh, suitable to be given mathematical form. The key figure in um, overthrowing the Aristotelian conception was Descartes. There were other people who were very important as well. Galileo was, of course, very significant and very significant as an influence, uh, influence on Descartes. Um, but Descartes had this idea that get rid of this idea of causal powers and functions and ends and maybe there would just be mathematical principles which describe how things move around. But he thought that what made things move around was not their causal powers, but God. So his view about laws was very theologically influenced. And uh, Newton and Seth bought into this a great deal, although what Newton really thought is hard to tell. Newton kept things, you know, close... Uh, <laughs> Maybe he told Clark, but he didn't tell many other people about what he really thought. But in any case, the, the general view was that God moved things around, that every motion of everything, every molecule, every particle, the particles in your body, um, uh, with one exception, I'm going to come to in a second, um, the, the most of the planets, rocks, when they roll off 
uh, uh, mountains and so on. They're moved by God, actually. Uh, and um, there were principles that describe how God moved things around. And Descartes wanted to find out what these principles are. These are what laws of nature are, according to Descartes. They're the principles that describe how God moves things around. Descartes thought that God was like Descartes. He was a mathematician. Yeah, yeah. And so he thought these laws would be mathematical and they'd be fairly simple and they'd unify and systematize motion. So from the very beginning, the idea of laws had these two ingredients, two aspects. One is that they govern or describe how God governs how things move. And the other is how they systematize and unify all of God's creation. These theological elements dropped out of the concept of laws as science developed. Although this metaphor of laws governing stayed around, but you might wonder, you might scratch your head and wonder, how can laws do governing? You might have thought, well, God does governing because God is a guy like, you know, I don't know, like like uh, who's like uh, who's the governor of England now? I forget uh, who's taking uh, over. I, we don't have governors in states, but our prime minister is Keir Starmer, just replaced Rishi Sunak. Yes. Okay. Okay. Whatever the governor, you understand how a governor governs. But how does it, and so you sort of I think that well God is like the prime minister or the president or something like that. But now we have these things called laws. How do they govern? And the subjects of laws, well, if they don't satisfy, they don't follow the laws, they can be punished or put in jail. But you can't put rocks in jail if they don't uh, uh, follow the, uh, uh, you know Newton's uh, laws. So. This metaphor, what does it really amount to? Hmm. But the metaphor stuck around. And one of the main ideas about laws is that laws just replaced God as the governors. And they play the role of making things happen. This idea really stuck. And many people have it. And I think it's really terrible. That That's and very interesting. Right, that agrees with me. Yeah, so I, if I could too. just uh, interject there, Barry, as well. So we're going to get into elements of whether laws uh, govern as well. I know you cover that in the package deal account as well. But just in terms of um, uh, the necess necessity of mathematics, that mathematics are laws themselves. I know that's evolved somewhat since the days of Descartes, but I do find the role of mathematics, especially in... Um, high level physics as well. If you look at the problems it causes in string theory as well, I do think the function and the role of mathematics with their uh, logical necessities is something that's very important for uh, physical laws as well, because if the maths doesn't match, then many scientific theories are instantly thrown out. And I think there's something that's driving the logical necessity for mathematical equations and how they pin onto empiricism that's important and overlooked for the laws. I sometimes think that laws are too easily reduced to mathematical logic, but we can touch on that a bit at the end. As for the fact of laws governing, um, so, okay, how do you, you can't punish a rock for not obeying a law, but surely the rock has to obey, obey a law of motion as it, as it goes through. So well, what's your issue with uh, laws and your problems with governing? Because to, to most people, the laws of physics do have to govern um particles they do have to govern elements of um motion and obviously the laws of thermodynamics obviously govern certain states so when you say you've got a problem about a law governing please expand on that well it's a metaphor and i don't really understand what the metaphor could amount to R How really you, so govern now you, you know a lot of there are a lot of things that you said a little while ago there are various presuppositions about mathematics and so on that would require a bit of discussion. Uh, you seem to like, I know from looking at what some of the you wrote, you like the notion of necessity a lot. Many philosophers alike will like it. I'm not one of them. I got it. So first of all, uh, before we get into elements of necessity, and obviously I know uh, Hume, uh, Hume wasn't big on necessity, I have more on regularity. Before we get into elements of necessity this is why i find bits of the pda and bits of the bsa to be quite instrumentalist as well which can be a good thing uh, so you don't like laws because you don't 
get the the metaphor. So, um, in what respect then could be um, facilitating um, interactions or causal powers? I already can see you're going to have an issue with causal powers as well. If you've got an issue with um, governing, but um, it's a metaphor that you don't uh, like. So um, continue on that way. Don't like. Give me some reasons. Well, you know, philosophy doesn't merely proceed by what you like and what you don't like. That's good for ordering dinner, but not for philosophy. And so it's not a matter of liking or not liking. It's a matter of coming up with different kind of views about what the world is like, what reality is like, and various views about how to make ex what explanations are and so on. And you have various views on the table, and then you want to develop them as much as you can and then see where each one has its advantages and its disadvantages. So, for example, Tim Maudlin, he likes a governing view about laws a lot. And I've learned a lot, and I think he would say the same, by us arguing with each other about these issues. Um, and, you know, I mean, of course, I think that my arguments are better than his, even though he's smarter than me. But, um, you know, that's the way it goes. So, so I can get into what the arguments are, what the views are in more detail. I did want to say something earlier, which I sort of skipped over about the history. When I was saying nobody has written a history of the concept of laws, the part which I think I'm really interested in, and I'm not a historian, but I'd really like to know a historian who's done it, um, is how the theological element fell away. The history of it falling away, because it happened slowly. There are many, many scientists who sort of kept using the theological notion and the idea that God needed to be around. And in fact, there was a British philosopher, I don't know if you've heard of course him or not, he's been dead for a while now. I didn't know him very well, but a friend of mine was a good friend of his, who was also a British philosopher who lives in London or outside of London now named Howard Robinson. Do you know him at all? Yeah, I know, I know the name, but he's not, it's not one of my... I mean, he's a strange guy, but I, so I, don't, I don't know what you're going to say, but he's, he's a friend. <laughs> we we, we don't want to go off into a side issue about why he's a friend and stuff. He's a, he's a good guy. But he was a good friend with a person called John Foster. Is that a name you know? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So John Foster wrote a book in which he argued that the concept of there being laws, that there couldn't be any laws unless it was a god in order to make sense of governing. I agree with his notion of laws. For his notion of laws, you need a God. Nancy Cartwright says the same thing. And so she concluded there are no laws. He concluded that there was a God. <laughs> I conclude, let's have a different concept of what laws are. Because I do think you need the notion of laws, but I think it can be completely separated from theology. Okay, just for, from my perspective, before I, I let you continue, what I think is very interesting as, as well, when I spoke to John Searle about this, and obviously I'm assuming, you know, John Searle from Philosophy of Mind, of course, um, he's got a great people way... people still speak to John Searle, I thought you can't speak to him anymore. Uh, I spoke to John Searle about five years ago, six years ago. Oh, now, oh, then you could speak to him. No, I know, I used to know Searle, I haven't spoken to him recently anyway, but I, I used to know Searle quite well. Right? Obviously, a, a notable philosopher of, of the last 50 years as well, John Searle, a great guy as well. I got this inspiration from him in terms of how he said, so what I also uh, do elements quite a lot on the, uh, consciousness as well, on the hard problem of consciousness. And John Searle said to me, which is a good way of putting it, the problem with the, the hard problem of consciousness and the whole duality that obviously the mind and the body problem that comes from Descartes, for him, that's a hangover from the Christian soul in terms of the division between materialism and the soul and the mind. And I like that. And the reason that for me, we still have these laws of nature that come from a, a theological explanation that we need God, but it's fallen by the wayside is due to basic uh, parsimony and efficiency. And Occam's comes that you don't need God, but you can use a tool for it. So if you can explain science, and I know this is contentious, but this is what a lot of philosophers of physics say, and also actually practicing physicists say this as well. If you can explain science just with its own laws, obviously that's problematic, hence why we're discussing this, but if you can explain science, phenomena, elements of observed reality with laws themselves, whether they're enclosed in the system or outside the system metaphysically, but if you can 
explain them that way without requiring a deity outside of that governs it, then you don't need the deity. You just take this bit here. So it's a bit of making it more efficient. Now, I know that's also controversial and you can comment on that as well, but that's how I like to think of why we still have governing laws. Because many physicists would say, of course we have a law, but of course we don't need a God. We just took the best bits from that and got rid of the rest. As for your thing on governing, just to make your point clearer. So if the um, the laws, say the laws of thermodynamics and obviously entropy, how does that operate without that being a governing law? Just to make your position more uh, clear in terms of you not liking that metaphor. So how do you get around the fact that um, for some, any, any of the laws of thermodynamics uh, work, have functions, but they don't govern, if that's clear? But first of all, the laws of thermodynamics are not fundamental laws. Okay. What is fundamental is something called statistical mechanics. And that's what this other book I sent you about is all about. But I, I don't think we want to go off into a big story about that right now. Um, the main point here is that the notion of something like laws that Descartes wanted to structure science in terms of was a powerful and interesting notion. But his idea of what he thought laws are doesn't make any sense as governors, but it does make sense as unifiers, as systematizers. Yeah. So my idea is to say what laws are, are principles that systematize what they fundamentally is. Now, to get into that, I couldn't get into that in much more detail. That would be to explain my own view, the package deal account of, of laws, but it might make more sense to lay on the table first the sort of ideas that were there when I came, when I sort of said, I started of thinking about this 30 years ago or so, because, you know, the ideas developed by David Armstrong and David Lewis and, um, uh, uh, Alexander Bird, he's a you know him at all? Uh, no, I don't know him personally. I never interviewed him. He's a, he's a British guy. literature, right? Okay, but, okay. And, and and I was interested in what those ideas are, and which I what those ideas you're making sense of them philosophically. While the notion of law played a central role in science, um, in fact, let me make it even step back to say something which I think is very important here. Descartes had this conception that maybe you could come up with a few mathematical principles such that they would describe how, the, how God governs the motions of the fundamental stuff there is, which makes up everything else, and it would describe how he governed it and would systematize it because they'd be few and simple. And Descartes tried to come up with some, uh, but he didn't do a very good job. His, his, his science was not adequate. He had some good, some ideas which were picked up on. And maybe this idea of there being fundamental laws which describe how everything moved around would have just died if it wasn't that 80 or 70 years later, the, the, you know, maybe the greatest or the second greatest mind that's ever existed came into exist, came around. But so Newton was, Newton actually came up with a, a, a few basic principles, really just very few. It's an amazing. I mean, we teach this to school children all the time, but we don't teach them what an incredible thing this is. This is just like astonishing that there could be a few basic principles that everything that moves, moves in conformity with these principles. And these principles, when you combine this with the idea that the world is made up out of what Newton thought of as particles, or we later thought of as atoms or, or more fundamental things, and that they conform to these laws. And so bigger things conform to the laws because their parts conform to these laws. You basically get laws to describe how everything moves, rocks and tables and chairs and animals and people maybe too. It's another point I skipped over, but we might want to come back to it in a minute. Because you're particularly interested in mind-body problem things, so we'll come back to them. If Newton didn't come along, this idea about that Descartes had about the being laws of nature might have just died. Mm. So Descartes' dream, in some sense, was fulfilled by Newton. Now, Newton didn't get it exactly right, but Newton gave a big impetus to this, and then other people picked it up and worked out the details more. Um, 
uh, um, Hamilton uh, in, in, uh, in Scotland and England and Lagrange in France. And then later, uh, Newton's way of thinking about light didn't work out, wasn't quite right. So uh, the great, the other one of the other great thinkers, maybe number three on my list, Maxwell, number four on my list, Maxwell Boltzmann comes number three. Ma uh, 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 Maxwell figured out how to do electromagnetic That's theory and have a theory of light. And there was a problem with that. And so Einstein fixed all that up. He's number one. on An interesting thing, I remember being about to say this earlier in our conversation, is that while the notion of laws was very central and important in the sciences, all for, after Newton in the 19th century and the 20th century and so on, um, there was very few philosophical discussion about what the nature of scientific laws are. For example, Wittgenstein says almost nothing about it. Hmm. Wittgenstein, you know, was an engineer. Supposedly, he was educated in science. Mm -hmm. He paid almost no attention to the science of his time. Now, I don't think he knew the first thing about relativity theory, even though it was going on around that. Quantum theory was being developed with Wittgenstein. I can't understand how you could be a philosopher and not pay any attention to these things that were going on. That's why I have such a, not a, such a great opinion about Wittgenstein. Now, it's true that what was really in the air then was the development of mathematical logic, and he did pay attention to that. Okay, but getting back onto my thing now is philosophers didn't talk much about laws. It comes up a bit in another one of the important philosophers in the 20th century, Nelson Goodman, who talks about it a bit. And of course, there was this idea that David Hume had views about laws, but he didn't really. Hume almost says nothing about laws. He says a bit about, he says a lot about causation. But you get the idea that Hume really didn't like there being necessity in the world. And I guess that's right, although there are some philosophers. Um, Peter Strawson's son, Galen Strawson, thinks that Hume really didn't banish necessity. I don't know if this is right or not. He's a historian. Well, but... yeah, if if I may here quickly, Barry, just my uh, quick two thoughts on that. So I don't think he has... I don't think Hume has banished necessity. And to a certain extent, you could, and I'm a big fan of Hume. You can say, obviously, Hume is somewhat paradoxical. Obviously, he didn't like necessity. It was all about regularities. Causation for himself is quite tricky as well. Obviously, he's got basic antecedents, but because of inductive logic, you can never know if there's a cause um, formally in a proper sense. But if he, he if he attributes, obviously, everyone knows the, the, the famous description of the billiard boards. If you if you ascribe that to regularity, it's difficult to see how you can have an antecedent doing something, whether it's a causal power or regularity, without there being some kind of necessity. Now, I know he's saying that due to inductive logic, you can only really pursue the irregularities, not formal causation. But there is something that's quite a paradoxical about that in general. But 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 you know, David Lewis picked up the idea that that's why he calls his view Humean mm. that. He doesn't want there to be fundamental necessity. And he, the way David Lewis got this from Quine, Quine is really the great skeptic of necessity. Um, and so Lewis, Lewis thought you really do need some notion of necessity, but he didn't want it to be fundamental. And so he modified Quine, but, but, but this is a whole other discussion. Okay, so the, the ideas were that laws were not really much discussed in the history of philosophy after Descartes. Uh, even Kant discusses it a bit, but he had a very Kantian view about laws. They're somehow products of the mind in some way. And you'll see later that my PDA has certain Kantian elements to it. People tell that to me in order to embarrass me, but... <laughs> I, you know, I, I didn't get it by reading Kant because I could never understand Kant. Um, but there, there wasn't much in the history of, of uh, philosophy discussion of laws. Mill a little bit and some other people, some French philosophers, but not very much. Uh, then when Armstrong came, I think Armstrong thought, you know, no one's taking the concept of laws really seriously. Let's real think hard about them. Laws got to make things happen. He was a governor view. So he's very important for Armstrong is that there were fundamental properties, what he called universals. Mm. What the world consisted of 
is universals being instantiated here and there and there and there. So the, this is universal being instantiated there, made the universal of being an electron, since the universal of, of uh, being red, whatever, the, all, all these universals, he had a world of universals. Uh, I think he wrote a book called Universals, in fact. Okay, laws were necessary connections between universals. Only he didn't think they were logically necessary. He called them contingently necessary. Now, if you don't choke when you say that, I don't know what will make you choke. But that's what he called them, contingent necessities. Yeah. So I don't call them. So for him, they were over and above the ordinary facts. So the ordinary facts are this universal there, that universal there, this universal there. Maybe some universals are universal relations relating this thing to that thing. That's what the world consists of. But then there were these things called relations between universals, laws, and it's them that constrain or govern or move the ordinary facts around. That's the Armstrong picture. So the technical word that philosophers got to use a lot, particularly after Donald Davidson, another interesting philosopher, is supervenience. For Armstrong, the laws did not supervene on the ordinary facts. That's going to be an important word in the rest of our conversation. Yeah, yeah. That means that keep the ordinary facts the way they are. Imagine now that you can have different laws with those same ordinary facts. So the ordinary facts by themselves don't determine what the laws are. The laws, in some sense, determine what the ordinary facts are, but not in the same sense. They determine by making the by by taking some facts and making other facts out of them. This is sort of Tim Maudlin's view about laws. The laws, he's a more up-to-date contemporary physicist guy because he knows about physics, unlike most of the other people we've been talking about here, like Armstrong and so on. Um, uh, he was thinking about laws the way physicists do. And so the dynamical laws operate on the state of the world at a time to produce the state of the world at subsequent times. Yeah, well, just to just to pick up on two points there before you you continue there, which is very interesting as well. So, in terms of Armstrong's contingent necessities, I do find that problematic in terms of obviously that can be a bit of a tension as well. But I think what what he's trying to say, though, he eventually runs into the, the dynamical laws problem as well, is that you can have a backdrop of these universal laws that occur, but what links them uh, when they interact, for example, through a property or a power is uh, a necessity that underpins them as a law, but it's contingent as they operate. So that kind of gets away a little bit from fundamental necessity. I, I think so. I think if I understand what you're saying, I, I think it's right. But let me put it the way I would put it. It's a contingent fact that the law exists in the world. That's what's contingent. Yeah. The law itself is a relation between universals. The necessity comes in in that the law makes things happen out of necessity in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that can also be between uh, contingent properties that are still underpinned by something in necessity. Now, with, with the Maudlin point, which is very interesting because obviously the Armstrong point has problems with dynamical laws at, at moments in time which is very true and picked up on by Maudlin but Maudlin has a law as its own ontology and we can pick this up a bit later because then for me that line starts getting blurred in terms of uh, you've got properties you've got space-time structures you've got properties some are saying that's metaphysical. Some are saying it's not, it's just ontological. You've got some philosophers that say it's just epistemological. And you've got someone like Maudlin, who's not particularly crazy or wrong, saying that laws should be its own ontology. The way he rearranges that space-time doesn't necessarily, necessarily have to be a theory. It can be its own ontology. So yes. that, that there's that's right. I, I think bringing epistemology in here is not right at this point at all. But um, yeah, so for, but Armstrong is like that too. Yeah. Armstrong, the law is a part of ontology too. It's just what the ontology comes in is that it's a relation between universals. So they're not things, but the relation between universals. Now, Maudlin doesn't think of laws as 
things, literally, either, but they're part of the ontology. Now, exactly what laws are, you know, I've known Maudlin now for 40 years. I still don't know what exactly the laws are. Okay. Her, his wife is a, was a student of mine. She still is in some ways, or a you know, colleague of mine. Uh, still, we talk all the time. I still don't know what, what he really, really thinks laws. I, I, I mean, he just says they are what they are. They're just, it, it, it's something that we need to recognize as a, an, a kind of thing, a kind of ontology. They're not individuals, they're not properties, not relations, they're laws. Yeah. Um, but the main point is they don't supervene on the ordinary facts. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that, that, the thing about Maudin, which is very interesting as well, that I like as well, in terms of it ties into the actual practice of um, physicists as well, when they talk about laws as well. And it's very, uh, a deflationist account of, um, so to speak, that you get deflationist accounts of truth. It's a very much a deflationist account of laws in terms of, are they outside the system? No. Are they metaphysically? It doesn't matter. Are they in properties? No, they're just there. We have to recognize. Why are you saying deflationist? Why is it deflationist? Because it's not uh, philosophically or metaphysically loaded. Like what from my understanding of Morden is you just got to recognize they're there. And for example, when uh, a physicist is working with a law, they're not necessarily thinking why does this law operate like this metaphysically? Where does the law come from? It's just something that we've got to recognize is there and we work with it when we apply it to somewhere. So engineers- well, That's right, physicists are not philosophers. So they're not answering that question. Because they don't think they need um, to. You know, I ran across a very interesting uh, quote from one of the great philosophers who ever existed and never wrote anything. It's a person called Sidney Morgan Besser. Do you know, heard of him? No. Never heard of Sidney Morgan Besser? Joking, no, Look no. him up after our conversation. You'll find that Sidney Morgan Besser has the best quotes about philosophy ever from anybody. He was a guy who taught at Columbia, died about uh, seven years ago. I didn't know him super well, but I knew him. He used to call me up sometimes. One of the things he said, this came to mind when you're talking about, about Maudlin and, what, and, what, uh, and, and physics. You're right that physicists don't spend their time thinking about what laws are. They're spending their time thinking about what the laws, what laws there are. They don't want to figure out what laws are. That's what philosophers to do. Yeah, yeah. Business want to figure out what laws there are. And what so, they do. Yeah. And what they do. Okay. That's good for physicists. Now, here's what Sidney Morgan Besser said. He said, physics is like capitalism. That as long as everything is working right, Everybody is fine, they're great, they're getting rich. Philosophy is like socialism. When capitalism fails, you want to know what went wrong, what's really going on. You get the I point? Like also, it also reminds me of there's so many loaded topics and obviously the wars between physicists and philosophers and philosophers of physics as well. That's why I like... Um, people like Tim Morden that walks a tightrope between the two and David Mark Wallace does that as well because they're both trained in physics and philosophy and can't like, to a certain extent I suppose the Steven Weinberg quote where it's like it doesn't matter what whether what a law is this is what the a law does I don't really care about the rest of it that's quite interesting and obviously um, Feynman uh, his quote on how useful philosophy of physics is to anyone is obviously a very famous um, quote as well but that's why I consider it quite um deflationist and that's why i consider a uh, more but i don't think Maudlin's philosophical view is deflationary at all i think what you're doing is you're saying look you want to be more like the physicist who says i don't give a fuck i don't really care about what laws are i just want to care about what they do so i'll just use the notion not really care about it that's like the capitalist all right and, and morgan besser's line okay but philosophers want to know, what are these laws? What are they? And Maudlin is coming up with a view about them. Laws are an element of ontology separate from properties and individuals and fields and so on. And they do something. They take the state of the world at a time and they produce the state at subsequent times. Now that's not deflationary. That's the the just complete opposite of deflationary. If they ontologically exist in themselves, then it's part of an ontology. But then does that make that 
a metaphysical issue as well, because they must exist metaphysically as well as where some people can put an ontology underneath a metaphysics. If he's saying the laws are ontological and they run in tandem with other ontological entities, doesn't that blur the line between a metaphysical consideration and an ontological consideration for a law? I don't know what you mean by metaphysics. Metaphysics, my view is that metaphysics is just figuring out what the world is like, has to be like in order for science to be successful. That's all metaphysics is. Oh, okay. I, I, well, metaphysics is a loaded term as well. I think metaphysics goes into elements of, not to get into Alvin Platinga, but elements of what things exist uh, by necessity outside studies of uh, ontological reality as well, which is quite theologically loaded. But in terms of, I don't know how you feel on the great question of um, what constitutes as nothing, uh, why there is something rather than nothing. Some people think that's not metaphysically possible. I think that I think that's um, an interesting topic in itself, but that's why I think is hardcore metaphysics as opposed to the metaphysics of what things may exist, what a universal is. And metaphysics uh, for me is something that precedes or supersedes an ontology in terms of there has to be a metaphor, metaphysical system for something before we get into ontological considerations. I know some philosophers don't care about that, but that's I feel metaphysics is slightly stronger than any ontological paradigms because ontological paradigms are just embedded in elements of what properties exist how you can study them empirically via uh, observation which isn't the same as saying why they metaphys metaphysically have to exist as so for me a law is very interesting like that as well because ontologically you can arrange anything in any way you want you can measure it and verify it in any way you want uh, but uh, a law metaphysically may say that something has to be this way or isn't this way, but metaphysics for me is slightly different than ontology. I, I know you, you may disagree, but that's how I feel. I think metaphysics is more than just the way the world is. That can be answered by ontological considerations and the practice of physics. Well, I mean, I just sometimes we mean by ontology, just a list of the kinds of things that exist. I mean, metaphysics also involves yeah. not just a list of what exists, but how they can be related to each other and so on. So in that sense, I agree that there's more in metaphysics than just what the way I just characterized ontology. But you're making it sound as though metaphysics is a whole separate uh, enterprise. And I don't see that. I think that there's reality and what we want to know. I mean, I, I don't know what else to call it than reality is what it is. Yeah. What is it? It really ex exists. That's what we want to know. And what's the best way of talking about it and thinking about it and explaining explaining it? That's what we want to know about. And yeah, no, I, I agree with that uh, principle there as well. I think what's also potentially um, unclear and confusing is, I agree with you, there's a certain overlap between metaphysics on ontology and they're often used interchangeably and i can see why people do that especially when they're, what is reality but there's certain bits that um distinguishes them as well um which is interesting so i i i, I see how people uh, use the two but i like to think of ontology as something separate to metaphysics but when i say that i get the pushback as well I don't think metaphysics is separate to ontology as well and that's the the elements of uh, interchangeability so i find um those bits potentially confusing in terms of on the one hand people treat them distinctly and some people uh, treat them interchangeably and that's a sort of element that arises uh, in a potential um, controversy behind someone like Tim Morgan seeing that a law <clears throat> is an ontology as where some physicists would say well not necessarily I mean the ontology is that there is a particle there but that's got nothing to do with what the law is but that that's why it's um obviously contentious to discuss these issues and that's why obviously certain physicists don't care about the um the philosophical natures of the laws of nature um is there anything else you want to if there's nothing else you want to address there um well, yeah I, I just wanted to describe the views that were there w w when so to speak i don't know what to say 1980 in the 19 or 1980s to the 1990s that the the Prior to that, the concept of law was not much discussed in philosophy. It was discussed mm. a bit by Goodman and Quine and Hempel and so on, but not a lot. And so far as it was discussed, it was very much under the influence of positivism yeah. that was before that. Um, but then when Armstrong came, it was almost like Armstrong said, 
you know, we have to take the notion of law really seriously. Now, you think that somebody would say that, would sit down immediately and open up a book in quantum mechanics. But my guess is Armstrong never opened a book in quantum mechanics <laughs> in his life. I actually had him as a teacher, so I can feel pretty confident in what I just said. Um, uh, he was busy doing, uh, there was a course in the, in the Materialist Theory of Mind. You may know that book. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, okay. All right, okay. So, well, that was a long time ago. Okay. So, he, but he didn't do that. Instead, he just had the idea that laws govern. And so he came up with the view we just described before. And then we, I said that a better development of that idea was Tim Maudlin's idea in which laws are an element of metaphysics or ontology. In fact, the title of Maudlin's book is The Metaphysics Within Physics. So he looked at physics to tell you what metaphysics is. And I, I go with that a lot, even though I don't come to the same conclusions. Um, and uh, uh, he came up with the idea that laws don't supervene on the ordinary facts. And that he agreed with Armstrong, but he did disagree with Armstrong's view about laws being relation to the universals. He thought of them rather as taking the whole state of the universe at a time or as an isolated system and evolving it into subsequent states. So that required, in Maudlin's view, taking time, which you brought up earlier, really seriously, as time being fundamentally different from space and having a, temper a fundamental directionality in it. Because he needed that to make sense of his use of laws, notion of laws as taking the state at a time and producing subsequent states. Now, I want to get rid of all of that. That's was his view. A more sort of recent notion about the notion of law along these same lines has been developed by two other guys you might want to know about. One is a student of mine at San Diego, as mentioned before. He's going to be all over the place now. He's writing 10 papers a day, and he's going to become the, the top philosopher of science soon. It's Eddie Chen. Run across his name. Yeah, I'm actually planning to read one of his um, collections uh, this week. Ed, Ed Chen is, yeah, I've already got one Eddie of his. Eddie Chen is everywhere. But, you know, he's a good friend too, and he's, he's, he was my student. He was my PhD student. But him and another friend, Shelley Goldstein, who's the mathematician at Rutgers, who's the main developer of Bohm's version of quantum mechanics, they've written a paper coming up with another account of laws. I don't want to go into it in detail, but it also is a non-supervenience, a kind of governing or constraining view, but it gets rid of this bit about time that Maudlin has. So I describe these views briefly in my book that I sent you. Yeah, yeah. Now that I, I've, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great book and that it's covered as well. So Eddie Chen's already on my radar this week. He's got some good things on, on the laws, but um, uh, continue, continue with your, your own okay. laws. So, okay, so these, these, these governing views, the other kind of non human view, or non-supervenience view, so to speak, was a view developed by, mostly in England, by Alexander Byrd, and I can't remember the names of the other people, but it was, it was a throwback to Aristotle. It was to basically say what's really fundamental are causal powers. And the laws are just descriptions of generalizations that are made to hold by causal powers. This view fits very poorly with physics. I'm not saying it couldn't be fit together, but nobody has done the trouble of trying to fit them together. I, and I don't know if we want to get in a big discussion about it, but I'm just telling you that there's this other view around. And then there's the yeah. Jungian, so-called Jungian views, which I want to talk to you about. Yeah, before you get onto the Union views, causal powers, that's another one slight necessity for me. So yeah, I think we can get into that. Just I want to get some clarification from you and your, on your perspective on as well before we do unionism. So it's the whole thing about whether you've got a fundamental law or not, or whether you've got fundamental necessity in there. I'm quite partial to Armstrong's view as well, although it runs into tensions in terms of when dynamical laws come to play as well. If yeah. How would a law not have a causal power? But that, that's what I find quite interesting. For, to be a law means to resolve, and I'm not getting into determinism and issues in determinism and Laplace's demon and all of that stuff. But how can we a do law- wanna, We do want to talk about determinism. Because the fundamental laws are deterministic. Okay. If they're fundamentally deterministic, which I agree with, how, to just take a step back here. 
How can a, a law not involve a causal power? Surely by definition it must, but this is what I want to get your perspective on. So um, I don't mind talking about causal powers. They're just not fundamental. They're not the thing, the notion in terms of which we explain other things. We're going to explain what causal powers are once we got laws. Once we have the laws there, we can then explain what causation is and what causal powers are. But okay, that's so the way it goes. Whereas these these other guys want to explain laws in terms of causal powers. What what about the there being the same by definition? Why can't a causal power just be the law? Not having a causal power the subject. So you're going to say why a law is what, uh, for example, might be unified in a system, and then from that we can divide the causal powers. That's fine. So what's the problem with Bird saying that no, no, the causal power is the law. The law is the causal power. Well, you could take that view. That view is like Maudlin's. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got no problem with that. Well, I have a problem with it. I don't think it's right. Tell, tell me the problem. Tell me the problem. Well, the problem is I don't know what these laws are or how they can do the produce, how they can produce, make anything happen. I don't think laws make anything happen in that sense. So, you're, so how do the laws make anything happen? So you're not happy with the causation making the things happen, interchangeably with the law? I do think there's causation, but it's yeah. not causation. You know, Bertrand Russell, yeah, one of your Brit guys. I love great him. Guy, philosophy. He he said another quote. I can do it off the top of my head. He said the notion of causation is like the British monarchy. It's kept around only because it's mistakenly thought to do no harm. Yeah, I mean, he wanted to get rid of the notion of causation altogether. And I don't think that's right. I think the notion of causation is central and important. But what he was saying is it's not fundamental. It's not a. It's not. When I say fundamental here, I mean it's not philosophically fundamental. And, and, I, and, I, and this is, I think, in our conversation, I see that it's been a confusion all along between what, the notion of being scientifically fundamental and being philosophically fundamental. Yeah. So um, some people would say that the necessity isn't a divide with that, but that, that's my thing. So Bertrand Russell obviously uh, didn't. His whole thing on causation in physics is obviously well known. That's an interesting uh, paper. So. I want you so when you talk about any confusions here, I want you um, to uh, uh, tell me why uh, causation can't just be interchangeable with a law, because you say that could be the more than account as well. So what, what's the problem? Spell that out. Why causation can't just be the law and why we need the law first and then causation coming out. OK, when you say can't be, that's not the word I would use. OK, I do think Maudlin's view is a coherent view. I don't think it's the right view. That's because I have another view, which I think is a better view. So I don't think it can't be. The problem I have with Maudlin's view is he has these elements of ontology. So in that sense, it's 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 more, um, what's the right word to use? What do they say when you have extra stuff around? Superfluous. Some obvious word. I'm, I'm, in my old age, I forget to use word, words sometimes. Superfluous. Is it having an extra things around? It's like it's like my office. A lot of shit around. It's, yeah. We have too much. I mean, stuff. that's a technical term. <laughs> no, right, too much stuff. Okay, there's a word that's it's that's a very obvious word that you use all the time. When you have extra stuff that you don't really need, so you have extra stuff. And furthermore, it's supposed to do something. The laws are supposed to make things happen in the same way that God governed things. I don't understand how these elements of ontology, the law of Nolan has laws how they can make things happen. Well, you say they cause things to happen, but he, don't, he doesn't really want to say that because after all, what is it that one thing, what, what we, when we think about causation, causation is a relationship between one event and another event, and that requires a law. To, That's what I'm saying. Relationship to hold. But so if we have a, a causation between a law and the state of the world, we need some other law. That's going to lead us into an infinite regress. Which I think uh, many things uh, uh, have trouble getting out of infinite regress. That's a separate conversation. So so if if a cause uh, makes something else happen, so to speak, a law can make something happen. So a law can be reduced to a cause and they could be used interchangeably. I don't see... I don't see why a cause needs to be a subset of a law, like you argue. Now, I get both accounts that are uh, adequate, but I think a law can be boiled down to its 
uh, causal um, elements and they can be used interchangeably, but you don't think they are, which is fair enough. Yeah, yeah. the notion of causation is not what you think. The notion of causation is really central and important. As Nancy Cartwright very nicely argued, that the notion of cause is important to us. She was arguing against Russell, not because it's a fundamental notion. She didn't think it was fundamental either. Well, I don't know what she really thought about that, but it's not really fundamental. But we need it because causation tells us what's effective, what we can do. Yeah. You know, I I can get my lunch because I can go upstairs and open the refrigerator and take something out. So I can cause something to happen. I can cause that to get my lunch on the table. That's an effective strategy. That's what causation comes in. But that's not what's going on with laws. Laws on Morland's view, take the state of the world and produce subsequent states. That's nothing to do with effective strategies. You don't think that's got to do with an effective strategy? I can see how it can be effective strategy. If you can explain well, who, it. Uh, whose strategy explain, is it? If you can explain and predict um, elements in physics, that could be an effective strategy based on causation. No, 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 no you're missing the point. Okay. The notion of causation, according to Cartwright, we have that. And, and you say this idea has been picked up by many, many, many uh, people, uh, Jim Woodward and, yes, and yes, a whole yes. slew of people now. Uh, and, and me too. I've just been writing about that this morning about how to connect counterfactuals and causation. And the idea that what we need causation for is to tell us what would happen were we to do such and such. That's what causation does. But in Maudlin's view, what the laws do is they take the state of the world at a time and produce subsequent states. You're saying, let's use his word produce and replace it with the word cause. I'm saying, okay, do that. But the cause there doesn't mean the same thing as I mean when I'm using it as saying that what cause do does is it tells me what would happen if I were to do this or to do that. Because I'm not doing anything. It's the laws that are doing it. I'm more in the, uh, the Maudlin camp in that as well, but it's also an element of interpretation semantics in terms of what we mean by causation and effective strategy as well. Sure, of I course. Much, much is, and, and I notice in our conversation, I could almost every conversation you get into with other people. I don't want to go into the side thing about telling you I'm in a conversation right now going on and on and on with a very famous film director. We'd have much more fun if I tell you about that than our conversation now. But unless, when this is all over, if you want to hear about that, I'll tell you about that. Uh, and possibly if, we, if we've got time, this is, it's like the whole thing. I had this with a new Seth, the neuroscientist in terms of uh, causation and predictability, obviously going back to Popper's arguments on predictability. Yeah. It's like- Those are closely related for sure. But. Yeah, it's, it depends. It's like the, the, the dry cut um, dichotomy that some scientists play versus philosophers of science as well. Um, scientists tend to be more clear cut and dry and they let all the uh, potential room for ambiguity go to philosophers as well. So uh, the argument if causal intervention, obviously James Woodward, who's done a lot of work in that space as well, and going back to predictability with uh, Karl Popper. How could it be anything else than causation? If you can't, if you intervene on it and you change it, that must be causation. You can get into loaded elements of uh, what causation might mean in different contexts. Like you're saying, some scientists will be like, I don't care because if I can intervene on it, how could it be anything else than causation? If I can predict using it, how could it not be causing? Now, granted, that's a basic view from scientists as well. That's not as loaded as philosophers, but that's the, the different element for it. When people talk about causation the interpretation to it so i'm quite um sympathetic to um the the maudlin point in terms of uh causation could be a law and it doesn't really matter what's governing it or where it comes from it's just a uh, a is causing b b is following from a whether you want to call that causation a law it's a semantic issue but this is this is why you're here because you've got more to say than laws about that so continue yeah. so i want to come to that i, I want to give you a whole other way whole other different way of thinking about laws the way you think about it i don't i'm not going i'm not doing this to convince you but i want to open up your mind okay like i said earlier in the very early in descartes 
the notion of law had these two aspects. What laws do is they govern, they make things happen, but they also unify and they systematize. Now I'm going to tell you about David Lewis's view about laws, because he picked up on the second thing that laws do is they systematize. But before doing that, let's go back into physics a little bit and think about the worldview that Einstein gave us. And it's going to also maybe uh, have to do a little bit getting into talking about time. You know, one thing about philosophy is that you can't talk about one thing without talking about everything. And I think that Scow, who sounds like you talk to, I think he has views that are very different from the views I'm going to tell you about. But I think he and I would be in very much in opposition. But I may be wrong about that. I don't really know him. I've met him, but I don't really know him. I'm not sure. Okay, here's what Einstein. Einstein said, look, in order to make sense of how to combine classical mechanics and electromagnetic theory, we're going to have to say something is very different about the structure of space-time than what Newton thought. Newton thought there was space, the three dimensions, and he thought there was time. And Newton thought of time, something very much similar, like Maudlin seems to think about it. And Newton says that time flows or something like that as a direction. So he thought that time is very different from space. But Einstein said, no, time is not really different from space. There are really four dimensions. Let's call it space-time. Um, but now, in keeping track of which one we want to say is time and which one is space, that really is relative. That's why it's called the theory of relativity. Relative to how things are moving. So really, reality, from the perspective of, let's say, God looking down. Don't take when I use, use God I as a metaphor. Like don't take it seriously. Looking down, you don't see space and time. Now, if that's what you saw as space and time, God looking at it, God isn't in the time. God doesn't in time. God doesn't have a watch. I have a watch in my Apple watch. God doesn't have a watch. God doesn't exist in time. There's just a block universe. Just a block. All the events laid out in front of God throughout all the space and all time. Einstein liked that, but he said, no, this, the ge geometry of this is a bit different. So that space and time get sort of mixed up. They're just four dimensions. And which one counts as time and which one counts as space is really dependent on, on the operation of the laws and how you're moving in the in, how you're moving and how the laws operate on uh, on you because of how you're moving. Okay. I like that idea. David Lewis, he wasn't really taking Einstein. Forget about the the relativity part. I wanted to bring that in to give it some bona fides. Just take the block universe. That's what Lewis started with, with the block universe. What's real is just the block universe. What's the block universe? Well, it's fundamental things instantiated in a space-time structure. Lewis gave this a name. He called it the Yumian Mosaic. Why did he call it Yumian? Because when each thing that occurs in this space-time could occur independently of anything else that occurs in any other region of the space-time. There are no necessary connections between things that occur in space-time. He called this view Yumian supervenience. Maybe it has nothing to do with the real David Hume, but this is what Lewis called it. And it, it's a remarkable, astonishing metaphysical thesis that what the world really is, much clearer than anything Kant said, as far as I know, is a Jungian mosaic. Everything there is, is what it is because it can be explained in terms of the, the distribution of events in the Jungian mosaic. Now, Lewis went a bit further, although I don't think we want to talk about this today because it's a whole other podcast. But he said, there's not just one of these Jungian mosaics. Reality consists of many, many Jungian mosaics. That's his many world, is his version of, this has nothing to do with quantum mechanics, many worlds, but his, mm -hmm. you know, possible worlds view. And he did that because he wanted to explain metaphysical necessity by reducing it to truth in all possible worlds. 
but that's another discussion. Yeah, uh, so that's not what we're talking about now. Yeah, that this I a possible world is very interested. It's this arguments to be made of whether you can actually have a possible world without referencing this world, which makes it quite paradox paradoxical. So I get how it's used for a counterfactual, but all possible worlds in terms of I know it's bits of mode logical as well. I find it odd, and, and I'm by no means a David Lewis expert in terms of a possible world has a reference point, which is this world. So you think you might be talking about a possible world, but really you're just copying this world in different modal logic. So it works and kind of works. And the way for me that it doesn't work is the way how Alvin Platinga took bits of it in his own, own modal logic and tried to basically solve the problem of evil for Christian theology. You don't like telling about Lewis is because you think that you can only make sense of all possible worlds by there being the actual world. Yeah, yeah. So the, the I might go of, along with that. That makes sense to me. I think Lewis might even make sense of that. As we agree with that, as far as making sense, but he he does think that what exists in reality are all of these possible worlds. It may be that we can only understand what they are by being in our world, which is the actual world. But that doesn't mean that these don't exist independently of each other. Some other philosopher who thought something and I didn't catch who the name was. Yeah, no, no, apologies there, Barry. So I'll, I'll speak a bit slower if I can as well. So no, we both agree on the Lewis account as well. So I think a possible world is a great for counterfactuals as well. It's got limitations, but I get how it's used as a reference to this world. So it kind of works as well as to whether you're really looking at other possible worlds is uh, something that can be up for interpretation, but we both agree on uh, on um, Lewis's point there, and it's good for modal log logic and counterfactuals. The problem is, though, when you can use that, is the way Alvin Platinga has used that modal logic yeah. to prove that evil isn't a problem in Christian theology. Did so, you say the word, did you use the word use or abuse? Uh, yeah, very good point, a bit of both. So if you look at Alvin Platinga's work on possible worlds, He's got a system where there isn't a problem of evil in Christian theology, which a lot of people would say is controversial. Alvin Platinga, obviously a noted philosopher as well. Uh, do, you, do you know that argument? I'm afraid I do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I don't know what I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but that's an abuse, perhaps, of um possible worlds. I just want to, before you, uh, you've done a great job at um surveying the landscape. But John and David Lewis in BSA before you move on to specific elements of the PDA yourself. I just want to get your thoughts on this uh, uh, human uh, mosaic and just your thought Wait. on this because, uh, because the space-time block is something that exists, it's there and it's real um, and I, I'm not, I don't want to anticipate your answer but I just want to get your thought on this which goes into elements of um, realism and anti-realism as well. So Yes, the human mosaic that David Lewis employs when we look at the, the space-time block is something that is there and something that is real. Fine, no issue there. The problem may arise where certain physicists think that space-time itself is kind of dated and it's on the way out. And that one notable physicist there is Akani Hamed. So my question to you is, are you concerned? Do you not see it as a problem because it's going to be anti-realist anyway? The fact that the space-time block might be replaced anyway going forward. Is that an issue for you? I'm a realist about everything that really exists and an anti-realist about everything that really doesn't exist. Okay, okay. So okay, now let's see what's going on here. I want to explain Lewis's view. I'm just now explaining Lewis's view, not my view. Lewis thought that what actually exists is the Yumian mosaic. Mm -hmm. It consists of a space-time in which Fundamental properties are distributed at points in space-time. And then I went on to say, he actually thought there were a lot of these human mosaics around, but they don't all actually exist. Only one actually exists. These others are merely just possible. Except, I went to modify it, but he thought actual was an indexical. So if there were people living in one of these other possible worlds, they would say their world is actual. But we didn't want to get into all of that. Okay. Now, just to go back to the Yumian mosaic, what exists is the space-time and the distribution of fundamental properties in the space-time. Now, you then seem to bring up a worry about what exactly space-time is. Is that right? 
Uh, that that's correct. If we're taking space time to be in the the Einsteinian sense, not the classical philosophical sense, as it's always been considered throughout history. If we take uh, the space time manifold, Einstein, if if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and what I what, any confusions I've got here, but if that is a the space time block, if we're talking that 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 exists and it is real, and we're talking that in the Einsteinian sense, then uh -huh. what what is the issue going forward where many physicists think that that idea of space time is going to be replaced as well, of which uh, Nino Meg is one of those uh, great uh, thinkers. He basically um, says that it's going to be in the bin, just like um, his notion of gravity. To a so just like Einstein's view of gravity, to a certain extent, changed and replaced Newton's form of gravity to a certain extent, this space time is going to be replaced by something else, meaning the space time block that exists right now as being real will not exist in the future. Is that a concern for you? I understand what they're talking about, future. The future oh, so is, is, in in like the, is in the 200 years, 200 years from now, where space-time is replaced by something else, or someone can unify a theory... Oh, that... you mean people might change their minds about science? No, in terms of... Yeah, um, it happens. Yeah, it, we... or if someone comes up with a grand unified theory that um, works at the marrying the micro better with the macro so what we understand now by quantum mechanics is replaced by something that's better in a, in a theoretical sense and the same that could happen of course yeah so it, and that doesn't make an issue for the space-time block now as understood by lewis no all you can do is to come up with the best view that you have now you can't come up with the best view that you're going to have in 200 years from now now because that's 200 years from now. So, so I don't understand what you could possibly be, have in mind. I, I must be missing what you're saying. Lewis yeah, is so giving I, you a view about what his metaphysics is. His metaphysics is, is a space-time block. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to make you, get you to buy into that by bringing Einstein in. Maybe that was a mistake on my part. No, no. I could have done it without bringing Einstein into this discussion. No, 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 that, that's also partially my fault. So, no, I completely get that, and I agree as well. It's just the fact that if we're using the metaphysics right now as uh, being contemporary applied, and obviously from Lewis, there's a fact that, there's a not a fact, there's a potentiality that that might be in the future replaced by something else, which is an element of, well, yeah, his metaphysics right now uh, could work, but in the future it might not work. So what I'm getting at, I suppose, is, you know, uh, the pessimistic meta-induction argument in anti-realism. The things that we once thought were clearly real have been replaced by something else. I have a horrible feeling that you've been infected by some anti-realist bug. No, and no, I wish no. I had a vaccine for you. No, no, no. Just in terms of, um, I don't know, there's, um, what's the great example? I can't think of the top of my head. The, there's, oh, what's the experiment? Um, the one from the 18th century, but I, I can't off the top of my head remember it. But the history of science does show that there are elements that things that were taken to, to be objectively true and exist and had causal power are no longer uh, used. That's and, certainly right. Yeah, that's, and that is the PESA, uh, the, the, induction, the argument against uh, realism. It's what, what Hilary Putnam also used to say, science isn't this uh, ches treasure chest of, building on top of knowledge and reality. It just gets replaced and things get cleaned out of the way. Well, so, you're talking about the history of science. You're talking about, but you're not talking about what there is. You're talking about what people's views about what there is. People's yes, views about what there is have changed. But with what there is hasn't changed. Uh, okay, so it is and it will be what it is and it is what it is, but our views about it change over time. Okay, perfect. People's Something. And I think, well, you're, you're what they class as a structural realist. I'm not a structural realist. I'm a realist. I think there's more than structure. Okay. So okay. some of the guys in your neighborhood call themselves structural realists. Yeah. Ladyman thinks he's a structural realist. He wrote a book called Everything Must Go. Oh, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. So I was asked to review it. I never did do the review. I had the title I wanted to write for my review, though, first. So I can tell you the title, okay? Yeah, what was it? The title was You Guys First. Yeah, bit, yeah. That's very interesting. So you don't think... It sounds to me that some of the, the principles you share are like structural realists, that the underlying nature of reality never changes. 
I think there's something to structural realism. I think that's an intriguing view. I'm not one of them because of some reasons we can get into, but um, I, I'm more closer to that. So I, I like Lady Minson, though. I like the idea of naturalized metaphysics and stuff like that. That's I'm writing in that vein. That's what I'm doing too. Okay. But the thing we were just into before is you seem worried that because people's ideas about what there is has changed, that reality changes. But reality doesn't change. When, you know, people used to think that was phlogiston. Yeah, that, that's the example, yeah, yeah. But it's not like there really was phlogiston when they thought there was phlogiston, and when they changed their mind, the phlogiston went away. There were, never was phlogiston. So I, I, I get that. And so right now there may never be space time, there'll be something else, but that's a structural realist argument that you can change parts of the properties go, parts of the theories go, they get changed, but the underlying structure is there. Or else how do you have an independent, perpetually existing reality without there being structural realism? Again, you, you can get what you know, realism. Keep clear between what we might think there is and what there is. The structural realists think that what there is, is just structure. Mm. I think that what there is, is structure plus what gets structured. We differ. Okay, that's a good way the structural it. realists you. think that we have views about what the structure is, and those views will say the same. Well, what gets structured, we may change views about that, but it never really existed anyway, because we change views about it. I think that's crazy. These we change our views about the structure too. Mm. What mm. structure there is, I, Newton thought what the structure there is is different from what Einstein thought the structure is. Quantum mechanics has a very different view about what the structure is, and different people who think about quantum mechanics think differently about quantum mechanics have different views about what they think the structure is. But if there is structure, it is what it is. Whatever anybody thinks. I'm not, I'm a realist. These other people aren't realists. They're pseudo realists. Yeah, no, no, I, I get that. I, I get that. And I like the way there's a difference between the structure and then what gets structured. So you're basically saying that structural realists aren't really realists as well. That's an interesting point. Well, um, the way you explain them, I, I wouldn't say that to them. I think, I don't think that they would explain themselves the way you explain them. I think what they think is that there is structure and that's what's fundamental. Mm. But we may change our mind over time about what structure there is. That's what I think they would say. I think what I don't like about that view is I think you've got to have more than just structure. Because you've got to have what there is that gets structured. We may change our mind about that too. Yeah. No, now, my, this may make my view closer to Kant's. You know, because you I think... Good. Yeah, in a sense, in a certain sense, because I think with Lewis, whose views are very much closer to Kant's like this, that in some sense, we never can know the stuff that what gets structured, except via what its structure is. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now that may, may confuse everything in our discussion now, but since you like Kant before, to make these connections, I made the connection. Yeah, that's, um, that's exactly how uh, I make those connections as well. And the the structural realist one's quite interesting if you think they're actually anti-realists as well. So that's actually very interesting as well. And I know they might not uh, agree how I, I describe them as well, but um, I think from my perspective, yeah, the structure might change, but they're still saying there's a structure as well. That's basically what I take from it as well. So it's realist, but you're saying that's anti-realist, which is obviously uh, very interesting and insightful at that, that stage as well. Lewis thought that what's real, he was a realist. Lewis mm. is a realist. He thought what's real and fundamental is the human mosaic and all these other human mosaics, except I'm not going to say that again because that just confused the matter. So just going to stick with the actual human mosaic. Then what he thought was everything else there is, tables, chairs, animals, tigers, you know, London, the Eiffel Tower, it is what it is because of what's going on in the human mosaic. And the human mosaic is a block. So time isn't moving anywhere, time doesn't move, no more than space moves, it's just a dimension. It's just the human mosaic. 
What laws are, are generalizations which describe aspects of the human mosaic. They unify and organize and systematize the human mosaic. Mm. They don't make the human mosaic. The human mosaic is what they do is fundamental. The human mosaic makes the laws. Like I said, I'm going to give you a very different way of thinking about things. This is Lewis's way of thinking about things. And you'll see in a little while that my way is a big modification of Lewis. But Lewis thinks that there's the human mosaic. Laws just systematize the human mosaic. I think this is a genius idea. When I first ran across this, I was very puzzled when I, I studied it when I was an undergraduate. I studied physics, physics was the subject I studied, and I was very puzzled at mathematics and physics by what laws are and what probability is, what chance is. These were the two big puzzles for me. Mm -hmm. And when I went and complained to my teachers and asked them, what are they? What are you talking about when you're talking about probability? They, they said very different things. The ones in statistics said one thing, the one in physics said another thing, the one in the history class said another thing. Eventually, they said, go to the philosophy department. I went to the philosophy department and said, yeah, we like to think about that. There are a lot of different views, but I did have a good philosophy teacher, and he sent me to a good graduate program um, where I got a beginning in this. I had similar questions about laws at the time, but I didn't really dig into them. I spent most of my career doing philosophy of language and philosophy of mind at a graduate school. That's what I wrote my dissertation on. But these were the real things that interested me. It wasn't until I much later that I got really interested in the, the philosophy of science. Not while I was interested, but I didn't start writing about the philosophy of science question. Uh, it wasn't until I actually moved to Rutgers, basically, or long before I moved to Rutgers. Okay, so law systematized the human mosaic. Lewis had another genius idea I'm going to bring up now, but we may want to get into it later. That, that's what probability does too. Probability, many people think that probabilities are, I don't know what they think. Some people think probabilities are propensities. You know, Karl Popper, who lived in London for part of his life um, at, the, at the LSE, he thought that, that probabilities are kind of like causal powers, but they're sort of weak causal powers. They just guide how things will happen or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Okay, or something. I don't think this is right. I think what probability does is we introduce the notion of chance to help us systematize things. Let me explain that in a real nice little image you could use. With Suppose the world just consisted of H T T T H T H H T T H T T T H T H T T T T. So you look at that and you see, my God, what a mess. You might even want to say it's random. You say it's random because you can't write down any simple mathematical algorithm which will describe that long sequence. But then you look at the sequence and you say, ah, I do see this. If I take a 10 of them, any 10 that I pick up, about five, if, I, if I just pick the 10, let's say in a group continuously, about five of them will be H and five of them will be 10. Not always, some of them six and four, some of them three and seven, but most of them would be five and 10 or close to five and 10. Furthermore, Although I can't predict what will happen next, I can't predict that in a big bunch of them, very close to half of them will be H's and half of them will be T's. Furthermore, if I have a degree of belief of one half that the next one will be H or a degree of belief of one quarter that I'll get two H's in a row, and I bet that way, I'll do well. This is David Lewis's idea. It's, I think, one of the best ideas that anybody ever had in the history of the world. It solved my question of what probability is. And that's why I think David Lewis should be number one. It's, it's, it's in my list. I think um... he told me both what laws are, what probability is at the beginning. I think I fixed up both of these things. My own work is to fix up his ideas sitting on the shoulders of the giant. Statistical laws and probabilistic laws as well uh, as something that we can get into as well. They, I, 
to a certain extent, they're also deterministic as well. Obviously, not in every situation, but there are statistical laws that mean nine times out of 10 can't be 24 times out of 23, whatever. We won't get into that. She's quickly mentioned some problems with the Lewis account and why your PDA account is uh, better. Okay, good. Okay, so we got Lewis's view clear. What laws are is they unify and they systematize the mosaic. I do want to bring say one other thing because this came up earlier a little bit. So you got the Yumi mosaic. It's what there really is. Laws are just propositions that systematize or unify the Yumi mosaic. Probability is introduced to help the laws systematize the Yumi mosaic. Connected to that is something that you might or might not have said before. Some people think that having probabilities is incompatible with the laws being dynamic laws being deterministic. This is a complete mistake. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Okay. Now, what about counterfactuals? We've mm. got to say something about that. Because you earlier sort of seemed to think that you got to have possible worlds around to make sense of counterfactuals. Now, no, in some sense, you, 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 Lewis's, the logic of counterfactuals made use of possible worlds. You could do that without taking possible worlds seriously in the way Lewis did. And that's fine with me. But I don't like Lewis's account of all these possible, you know, real possible worlds. That's not my view. I was explaining Lewis's view. I think you can make perfectly good sense of counterfactuals mm. without possible worlds at all. You can make sense of, use of, make sense of them in terms of probabilities. But that's a whole other discussion or podcast. But I do think that the Yumi mosaic makes the kind of fact counterfactuals true or false. And the counterfactuals are what makes causal relations true or false. So the Yumi mosaic is going to determine whether this event causes that event. Okay. So causation is going to be non fundamental, but a product of the Yumi mosaic. This is what I'm telling you. I'm going to give you a very different way of thinking about all this stuff. So the Yumi mosaic is what's fundamental. And it determines what the laws are, what the chances are, what the counterfactuals are, and what causes what. Now, of course, once we have what causes what, we'll also want to talk about this causes that, and so have this notion of this makes that happen. And that's perfectly fine, as long as we remember that that's not philosophically or metaphysically fundamental. That we might call that scientific explanation. Yes, yes. Explanation. That's very different. Okay. That's Lewis's view. Lewis's view is great. It's a real eye opener. Like I said, it's the most important development in 20th century philosophy, metaph metaphysics. Lewis's teacher was Quine, and I think Lewis was doing what he did in a lot to, to sort of, in response to stuff he learned from Quine. And another philosopher who's not thought about much more Look at these names. His name is last name was Williams. I can't remember his first name now, but he was a compatriot of Quine. But you're not going to know his name because he wrote he wrote he wrote, he wrote a book about about time, but it's not really read that much. But it's one of the great books of the 20th century. Oh shit! What's his name? Anyway, but he was also a teacher of Lewis and Goodman. He was a teacher of Lewis and Putnam. These were the big guys at Harvard at that time, and they're all very important people. Um, okay, so there you have Lewis's view. I guess you got it encapsulated in what I said. I don't think we've really done through it so that one could appreciate it, how astonishing and amazing it is that you can get all of this out of the Yumian mosaic. But I didn't like one thing about the Yumian mosaic. It was too metaphysical in a certain sense for me. Because Lewis had his what's fundamental, which is something he took from Armstrong, or maybe Armstrong took it from him, these universals, or what Lewis called perfectly natural properties. These are what they are as something that's in the world really before physics comes on the scene. Physics in Lewis's view, is trying to find what the fundamental properties are. But my view is going to be a bit different. My Pacagiel view is going to be something like physics determines what the fundamental properties are. 
Now, the way I just put it here, I've been saying I'm a realist all along. That's going to make me sound a little bit non-realist. So I'm going to, at the end, try to say why that's not so. Okay. But Lewis has these perfectly natural properties. And physics might get them wrong. So Boss von Frossen, you know him, right? Yeah, of course. Okay. Fat, so, so he 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 sometimes is characterized as being an anti-realist. I think that's not exactly right. He has a, a certain epistemological view about science. He thinks, but it, but he's not an anti-realist about what what there is. He just thinks that the views that science has come up with. There's no reason to think they're the right views, other than that they uh, are, get the results of experiments right. So von Frossen made an objection to Lewis, which struck me as being right. The objection was that scientists could come up with what they think of as the best theory of the world, something that Steven Weinberg maybe wanted as his uni as what he called the theory of everything. What, what Newton wanted, what Descartes wanted, what now we all want. We like this one theory which does the work of everything. It's going to encompass everything. In some sense, it's going to encompass biology, psychology, economics, you know, your 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 grandparents. It's going to have everything in it. And, and I, by that, I mean anything that can be explained in some scientifically way can somehow we can understand what those scientific explanations are in terms of this most fundamental theory. In this sense, I'm a, what's called a reductionist, as opposed to sometimes people want to have the special sciences being autonomous. Uh, that's another whole other podcast. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that is. Reduction okay. is so interesting. We won't get into the concepts of emergence either. Continue, Barry, continue, yeah. I think Lewis, I don't like the idea of taking perfectly natural properties as a fundamental feature of my metaphysical picture of the world. Because I think physics should tell us what's fundamental, not philosophy. Okay. So here, I wanted to take Lewis and drag him a little bit back to Quine. That's how I look about it. Quine really wasn't so much interested in metaphysics, sometimes, but he was interested in the epistemology of science. And I think he did a really great job about it. Although I think he actually learned very little science in his life. I think he could have, should have spent a little more time learning something about quantum mechanics or relativity theory. He learned a little bit. You know, he heard what was going on in the, you know, the physics department and the philosophy department are nearby, or they used to be nearby each other in Harvard. I'm not sure now. So he could have found out about them. And Putnam did learn about this stuff a bit, but I don't think Quine did. But he had a good view about the epistemology of science. His idea, and I'm now going to tell you something else for you to look at, because you're interested in this stuff, and it was an eye-opener to me, is as a Dutch philosopher, who I haven't met, but I'm going to read, meet soon, and I'm having this conference in the fall, because he's going to be in New York in the fall, and I want him to be in this conference. His, his last name is Van Der Wey, and I forget his first name right now, but you should look him up or write me to give a reference. And he wrote a book recently called Working Within. And that's a term he took from Quine. Because the idea is that you do science by working within. You start by, here's the world. We look around. What do we see? We see these objects moving around here, moving around that. We want to explain, why do things fall this way, fall that way? Why is it that when I, I put ice cube in water, it melts after a while? Why is it that I, I get an electric shock when I stick my finger in the electric plug, oh, you know, it's things like that. You want to know, explain these things. What science does is it comes up with fundamental principles which unify and systematize all the things that go on. So what I'm taking from Lewis is the idea that laws systematize. What I'm taking from Quine is the idea that where science starts is in the macros macroscopic world, where we start. And we come up with what's scientifically fundamental by coming up with elements of the world that help us systematize what's macroscopically fundamental. So atoms, we don't experience atoms in the macroscopic world, but they help us systematize what comes up in this, around the systematize in the macroscopic world. 
because they explain why it is that gases fuse, ice cubes melt, ink spreads when you put it in water, and trillions of trillions of other things, together with some general principles about how atoms move around, will explain all of this stuff. So atoms are more fundamental than tables and chairs and gases and liquids and ice cubes. They compose these things. So I'm looking for continuing this process, adding to ontology and laws by getting the best systematization of the macroscopic world together with what other ontology is introduced by way along the way to systematize the macroscopic world. We want to systematize everything. The unified theory of everything, the grand theory, will systematize the best systematization of everything. That's the package deal account. You just heard what it is. So the package deal account says the laws are the generalizations in the grand theory of everything that play a role in systematizing everything. And what's fundamental is the what science would say is the fundamental ontology of the grand theory of everything. So I'm much closer to science or real physics than these other views. Yeah, I can see you already quite aligned to the practice of uh, science as well. So just one thing I want to uh, ask you right now. I don't think this is unrealist at all. I don't think it's irrealist at all. No, I um, I can see how it can be open to the interpretation of it just being instrumentalist. It works. It unifies the system. And not to get into, so, you know how social scientists never quite fully understand elements of natural science. So this is something that Foucault and Derrida would say, he's just picking what he wants. No, no, no. And I'm not saying that. It unifies and it systematizes a, a law. That's fine. It could be seen, not necessarily as anti-realist, especially if you've got a fundamental ontology. I get that. Uh, it can be seen as instrumentalist. And obviously, Niels Borg, to a certain extent, is instrumentalist as well. Whether you take instrumentalism to be elements of realism or anti-realism is a separate discussion. This I, is not I, instrumentalist at all. Instrumentalists say, look, if if this instrument will help me, you know, Fish out the, um, the the coin that I lost in the in the thing. It's a good instrument, yeah. but if it can't do anything else, I'll throw it away. Uh, that's not the view here. The view here is it's not only got to be unify the macroscopic world. It's got to be true. It's got to be true. It's not just an instrument. Do you ever, that's the thing about the cat and how do you ever know it's true so in terms of how do you ever know that's another question how do you ever know anything exactly so when you when you talk about terms like true it's kind of loose how you operate that as well as to it being instrumentalist first so um in terms of it being a unified system that works and can help you fish something out of a pond it, the laws are something that unifies uh, the nature of reality and it systematizes it and it works and it helps you predict and explain. Many would say that's purely an instrument if you don't know it's objectively true. I don't think you do know. If somebody comes up with a, a, a proposal for, for this, it might be, look really good. For example, N Newton's theory looked really good for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Newton I together with so. Maxwell looked even better. That looked really good. And then people started looking at it a little more carefully and they realized Newton and Maxwell didn't fit together quite right. So maybe Einstein fixed it all up. That looked really good. But then people looked and said, but wait a second, these atoms, how exactly do they work? They looked at that and they realized they, 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 they some electromagnetic, and then they, how would the electrons, how could they be electrons together with negative charge, positive charge? How could they be there? They'd all collapse. So the Bohr came up with his model of the atom, but that was great that helped unify the periodic table that's what was great but it didn't wasn't very good as a theory explaining what the atoms were how were the electrons moving and how was around the protons it was terrible it had awful consequences so people came up with the beginnings of quantum mechanics and then schrodinger came up with a much better account of how all of this worked the only problem was that nobody could say at first what it was really talking about 
what is quantum mechanics we're saying there really is mm. well, that's a whole other podcast but there is will be some view some quantum mechanical field theoretic view combining that with general relativity that people will figure out how to work out right there are, are, are glimmers of how it is right maybe someone will come up with an account like that and it looks great it works mm. it, it explains everything that we know about the physical world and if it does that it's going to have thermodynamics as part of it and so that explains how ice cubes melt and gases diffuse and in my view that can be used to explain the truth of all counterfactuals that are true or false and causation that's true right or wrong and that'll explain everything that goes on in biology and everything that goes on in economics too it'll take a long time to figure out how all this all fits together but it will um, and maybe it'll look, maybe it'll all look really good maybe a 10,000 years from now, people will work this out and say it looks great, but it might be wrong. It's possible. Yeah. And how do you know if it's right or wrong, which is the counter thing? As to go the only to thing we can know is that it works. That's all we can know. And you can't look behind the curtain, can you? I don't know. And that's, saying, and that's what some people in the instrument, in, instrumentalist camp would say. That's all it ever is. No, I disagree is. with that. I think what there really is is something behind the curtain. That's why this is working. Okay, so what's behind the curtain makes this work. Yeah, yeah. My metaphysics of the BDA is there's something behind the curtain. I never thought about, you about using the curtain metaphor before, so I, 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 no, I like I'm it. Grateful, I'm grateful to you for getting me to, to use it. But, but, but what's behind the curtain that makes all this work is reality. So let me we'll say one or two more words about that. Reality is something which can be structured in various ways. But not any old way, but can be structured in various ways. Science is looking for structures which satisfy certain conditions that science has come up with. Conditions of unifying and explaining in the ways that science wants a system of meditation and the unifying and explaining to go. There might be other structures in reality too, maybe structures that poets could find or artists could find, or theologians could find. I don't know, that's not my business. But I'm saying reality has certain structure, not any old structure, and, and reality will determine what structure science can find. It might be that there's even more than one structure which will satisfy everything that science wants. That could be right, that's a possibility. And that way, there could be more than one account of what there is fundamentally scientifically, as far as reality is concerned. But it's reality that makes it so. In terms of what's behind the curtain, I like that as a metaphor as well. But to me, that's also a Kantian uh, argument. You can't know what's behind the curtain. As to um, many people saying whether your one is instrumental. Well, you can know a lot about what's behind the curtain. By inference. By doing science. And you know a lot that. about what's behind the curtain, but there might be other stuff behind the curtain that we don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I agree with that. And that's scientific prediction explanation, which is different from other elements of explanation we alluded to earlier. One more thing just to ask you if that's OK. So I want to get your take on this. So a law is something that unifies and systematizes uh, goings on phenomena, so to speak. Um, and you've done a good job at uh, uh, elucidating how that ties into reality. What would you say to clarify um, or, or comment on anything that says that because your account is about unification and systematizing, um, that's what laws do. Are what in in what way, given that being your your account of laws, in what respect is that just not being reducible to explanatory power? So what I'm asking you in a clearer sense is. How is your account not saying that the laws are just re reducible to explanatory power? I said, I do think that laws explain, they explain by unifying. So for example, when Newton came up with his laws, it unified the motions of the planets and the motions of, the, of, of cannonballs shot out of cannons. <laughs> and we saw that that is explaining because it <laughs> showed the connections between these two. That's explaining. So the idea that law is explained by unifying, that has not been explored sufficiently well by philosophers. Mm. It's been written about a bit by Michael Friedman and Philip yeah. Kitcher, although I don't like, I especially don't like the way Kitcher wrote about it. 
Friedman I like a bit better, but there's some other philosophers writing now. Uh, a guy who was a student of mine who now just got a job at Bordeaux in France. He's a French guy named Thomas Blanchard. And he wrote a very nice paper about laws as unifying and another philosopher at Maryland named Harjit Bar Bargol. So, so it's an idea that's coming around now that we should understand better what's meant by explanation, by unifying. Mm -hmm. Laws also do explain by subsuming, and this is part of it, unifying, and, and, and that's what governing really is. There's not, laws don't make things happen on this view, but laws do subsume mm -hmm. events. So there are some regularities which are lawful and some regularities are not lawful. Yeah. Things that happened in a regular way are just coincidental. Yeah, yeah. And some follow from the laws. Some follow from the way things are at a certain moment or part of what the way things are and the laws together. That's what thermodynamics is. Yeah, yeah. So thermodynamics is what it is because of the way the early universe was.